Well, welcome now into another episode of My Caring Conversations. This one has happened very much on the fly, somewhat spontaneously, because just this morning I was privileged to meet somebody who I'd never met before, who seemed to have such a fascinating story to tell in terms of his own life as a theologian, as a pastor, and who has, in the latter part of his career now, worked very much on response to natural disasters. He did his PhD in practical theology in how to help in the, U in the UK context uh, in situations of emergency and crisis. Around about 1989, um, I was faced with a, with a really critical incident in that there was a, a serious aircraft disaster that took place. Uh, actually, the plane landed on the motorway near, near to us and I was asked to respond to that. And I was involved in that, particularly with, with those who had been bereaved, uh, but also with those who had survived. But it wasn't until 2006 that I had the opportunity to do that in a full-time capacity. So I came out of the pastoral ministry and applied myself to this, uh, this PhD using the discipline of practical theology. It was after I completed my PhD that the post at the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion based in Cambridge in the United Kingdom came up uh, working with Professor uh, Bob White and that was to specialize in the field of so-called natural disasters uh, to uh, focus upon three of the most catastrophic disasters in modern times, in Haiti, in New Orleans, and, and in the Philippines. You said so-called natural disaster. Why that qualification? The disasters that we experience in the United Kingdom, apart from flooding, are all, you could say, pretty obviously human. The first disaster that I uh, focused upon was that following an earthquake in, in Haiti and then a hurricane in, in, in uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, in, in New Orleans and the super typhoon Yolanda in uh, the Philippine Isles. Now all of those are natural hazards. They are natural events, they are features of the natural world. In, in one sense, there's nothing wrong with them. Mm. Uh, we need them. Mm. It's when humans begin to interact with them that the real problems arise. And it's, my research has shown uh, that it's human factors that turn natural hazards into disasters. Mm. Mm. In social work they used to define a crisis as an upset in the steady state mm -hmm. and that for social workers to make interventions that were constructive you almost needed a crisis. The focus of my research in particular was to explore the religious beliefs mm. of survivors of these catastrophic events and to see how those beliefs influenced the way uh, those survivors um, interpreted or understood the uh, events, how they responded to them, how they recovered from them, and then also, very importantly, how those beliefs influenced, again, as you say, positively or negatively, how they influenced ways in which they would look to mitigate or to, to diminish the impact of the natural hazard upon them uh, in the future. It's possible to live with natural hazards and not die from them. We, we take on a wisdom of our own, if you like, which can at times be very self-centered, very materialistic, very greedy, in fact. Um, and it's when we do that that we lose, we lose control, if you like, of how, how to live uh, safely with natural hazards. That's when we become very vulnerable to them. And the way that plays out is not so much 
in an individual sense, although that is important, but it plays out systemically and structurally. So there is a socio-economic, mm -hmm. and I would say an issue of great social injustice, actually, mm -hmm. which uh, we can easily ignore when it comes to how we consider responding to, uh, to disasters. Brené Brown, who's had a big influence in my life, a social worker and author, makes the point that we actually are hardwired for altruism as human beings. Mm -hmm. That is our deeper essential nature. However, when we become more developed and sophisticated, and some people would say spoiled, mm. we lose touch with that. And in some ways, I'm it seems to me that the big opportunity of the so-called natural disasters we are facing is that it's a chance for us to, in a sense, wake up. Obviously, one doesn't wish disasters to happen so that we can uh, engage with these things. It would be lovely if we, if we engaged with these things without disasters. The disaster, if you like, enhances the opportunity uh, it, they certainly concentrate the mind, of course they do. When I went to Haiti, both as a responder for the earthquake and cholera, and then as a researcher, um, one of the things that really drew me to this research and drew me back to the Haitian people was um, the sense of community and belonging that they seem to have, particularly in the rural areas, in, in, in the city, it was still there, but not as strong as in the rural areas. Mm. The most effective, and it didn't really come out in the media, the most effective life-saving response to the Haitian earthquake was not the influx of, uh, of uh, relief workers from, the, from, from outside the international community. It was actually the people who lived there. Mm. They were the first ones to be digging people out from underneath the rubble of destroyed mm. buildings. They were the ones that were comforting the injured. Mm. They were the ones that were turning out mm. to, as nurses and as doctors. Mm. And, you know, that's something which was, I think is, is uh, mm. underestimated, underpublished, underrecognized in the media, mm. but it is incredibly powerful um, mm. in, 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 the, in the Haitian community. In the context of vulnerability, and look, let's face it, the planet is in a very growingly unstable situation. Oh. Um, the best thing we can be doing is to somehow continue to redouble our efforts in education of support of working, of creating cross-pollinating of stories so that those of us who are in our relative privilege in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg are more ready to cope with a disaster thanks to lessons learned from people who are living in those marginal positions. The point you make, I think, about education is, is, is very important. Mm -hmm. So we learn the extraordinary power and value of good education about natural hazards. Mm. We need to know about them. They are dangerous. Mm. It's a dangerous creation. Mm. But that doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's, it needs to kill or it needs to disable or harm. Mm. Uh, we just need to learn how to live with it. And education is a vitally important part mm. of that. OK, let us let it bring it all back down to the reality of what's happening right now on the planet, where we are seeing panic, fear, uh, sometimes overreaction, sometimes denial about what's happening with the spread of the coronavirus. What, what from your experience, can we educate, since we're talking about education, all those vast numbers of people that are going to be watching this video, mm -hmm. so that we can be better prepared. What would you think are the lessons on offer? Just to go back my, to my experience in Haiti when I first arrived with the, the cholera epidemic at, it, at, its, at its height at that mm. time. And 
These people had never had cholera in their country for a hundred years, if not more. So there wasn't the generational experience of living with cholera, uh, this disease that can kill you within three hours if you don't get the basic medical attention. And there was a huge amount of fear, you can imagine. Mm. Uh, there was no or very little clinical understanding of the, of the disease. Uh, and so when uh, the, um, the aid agencies came in, and particularly the medical aid agencies came in, with a very clear knowledge of the disease, of this particular uh, virus, um, initially they were met with hostility because of the fear. That is what fear does. It creates hostility mm -hmm. and it delays, actually, attention being given to the virus. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a big danger, I think, we are seeing at the moment with the coronavirus. I think there are two dangers. One is of uh, being too relaxed mm -hmm. and assuming that there, there is no problem. Mm -hmm. The other one is to go to the other extreme and panic. And, and fear, of course, tends to create panic. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the thing about the coronavirus is, again, we are or most of us, the general public, are very largely ignorant of what it is. Mm. We know it's, it has no vaccine, mm. uh, and that in itself can be very scary because we've come, become so used to vaccines and being sheltered from, uh, from disease by vaccines. At the moment, there is no vaccine. Uh, we don't know, if you like, how this disease will, will work in the individual. We know that for many people it will be a mild cold or a mild flu. We know that for some people there will be no symptoms, very few symptoms. But we know on the other hand, for some, it will be life-threatening and some will die. And I think it's the uncertainty about the disease and even if we knew about the virus, the uncertainty about who of us it will affect in what, way, in what way, that creates enormous fear. So here we have a situation, and this is what disease does like this. It creates uncertainty because we may become seriously ill or we may die. We don't know. And that really concentrates the mind. Uh, one of the things that Faraday does take very seriously is the public dissemination of its work. Mm. And we do that through our, our work with schools, that particularly focuses upon work with schools and with local churches. And in other ways, where it is possible, we do seek to influence public policy. Mm. I mean, that, that is something we would really love to, to, to be able to be more effective in, but it's certainly something that drives us mm to influence public policy uh, so that our research makes a difference mm. to life and particularly to the struggles of life.